I hope you're having a great Thursday so far. I know some people will join us later in the call. I know it was a bit confusing because this is not our usual time when we usually meet 30 minutes earlier, um, but this recording will be posted if the time difference was a little bit inconvenient for you. I know you guys are all busy as school leaders, especially this time of year as the school year comes to a close. But thank you so much for joining us today. We're really lucky to have um, Kasim, who is the founder and CEO of Solutions 8, and he is also the co-founder of Needle Marketing. Um, he is an incredible expert at all things paid traffic, Google ads, et cetera, and we're lucky to have him here to share some tips on how you can increase your admissions and tours in the Montessori space through paid traffic. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Kasim so we can explore this topic together. Thank you, Camilla. Appreciate you. Appreciate everybody being here. And for those of you watching the recording, I'm sorry that I ruined the cadence. Um, we had to align schedules. So that was my fault, but I'm hopeful that this ends up being valuable. Uh, first, for uh, the few that we have live, if y'all end up having any questions, I think that that's probably going to maximize the value here because otherwise it's just me talking at you. But I imagine the questions that you have are the same questions everybody's gonna have. And so if you don't mind guiding me a little bit, um, and nobody minds me using that word, then uh, I think it'll, I think everybody will benefit. Um, the piece about paid traffic that occurs to me is wildly important right now today is I think we're gonna see a seismic shift in the way information is being delivered to prospects because of AI. Um, a week ago, Google had what's called Google IO, which was Google's big launch party. And they introduced um, a new search construct whereby instead of giving people links and options to choose from, um, you know, so if you went, what's the best Montessori school near me today, you're gonna get 10 links. Uh, and then you're going to get ads and you're going to get 10 more links and you're going to add, you get 10 more links. Now what Google is moving towards, and it's still in beta, but it's moving towards delivering the answer, which should terrify all of us. And it should terrify all of us because we're leaving the responsibility of determining relevance to a machine and a machine that doesn't know pedagogical standards. It doesn't have Montessori training. And maybe more to the point is being trained on information that's meant to appeal to the lowest common denominator. So I think it puts Montessori and, and anything alternative at a disadvantage. And this is true for school, medicine, finance, um, any information that is counter-cultural or counter-mass narrative is going to be um, deprioritized. But so that's the bad news. We're all depressed. I'm so sorry. The good news is, is I, I think that I know how to contend with it to start at least A, and then B, on a long enough timeline, this actually ends up helping us. And it ends up helping us because we are countercultural. And I, maybe that's the wrong way to characterize this. If somebody has a better term for me, that'd be great. Counter narrative is better, I guess. Uh, but because we're counter narrative, if you're a school speaking the same narrative as everybody else. There's no chance of visibility whatsoever because in the hierarchical structure, you're a needle in a stack of needles because we have a massive value proposition um, that's unique, uh, especially depending on your geography. If you're the only Montessori school in the space, what I anticipate happening is um, Google and all other AI driven mechanisms are going to need to provide what I, I guess I, I'd refer to as um, channels. So somebody's going to search for something and then Google's going to say, here's more or less the answer. And then here's the choose your own adventure. And what's nice about this from Montessori schools is where prioritization probably wasn't top of, of the fold, let's say, um, prior to with the 10 pack, we're now going to get prioritized by virtue of the fact that we are unique and we do have a unique selling proposition, but it's only going to happen if we host quality content. And that's the linchpin. That's the actionable thing here, by the way. That's the, the piece that everybody needs to maybe take away and write down um, the, the key to surviving the AI driven search results is making sure that we have robust and quality content and a robust sitemap. 
Now, the good news is, is you get this through Nito, And actually, I think through Montessori Thrive, you get it for free. So I'm not here to sell anybody anything. Um, and I realize that our content isn't one size fits all. How could it be? But what I'm hopeful is, is the resources that we've provided free of charge are enough to maybe get the process started. Do the, the 80% of the heavy lifting, and then y'all get to come in and do the 20% of the, the sculpting. Um, a few very, very specific points, and then maybe I'll be quiet for just a moment and we can let discussion guide the conversation. You don't want to host pages that have multiple topics on a single page. For instance, a lot of schools and some of our website templates, by the way, we're going to need to revise this ourselves have a programs page. And then on the programs page, you'll see things, you know, like, oh, here's, you know, primary program, et cetera. And then it lists all of the programs on a single page. The reason this puts you at a disadvantage is because when your content is being categorized, you offer a signal of importance by dedicating a page to that content. So if you dedicate the page to programs, you're saying, hey, Google, programs are programs and go read through programs and do your best to distill information. Whereas if you have one page per program, that's a vote in favor of each of those individual programs. And it also allows uh, the, the what I'm going to call the dumb machine. And that's a, a line of demarcation that I'm not drawing, by the way. That's more or less the way that everybody in the AI space is thinking about this right now. There's the dumb AI and then there's the smart AI. And we're waiting for the smart AI to come. And when the smart AI comes, it's a whole new realm of problems. But right now we're, we're contending with the dumb AI. And with the dumb AI, you want to you know, lead the horse to water, so to speak. And so having all your programs on one page confuses the AI because they're like, all right, well, what's important? Is it the thing that's listed top of the page? And probably not because it's listed in chronological order. Is it the thing that has the most amount of content? How do I contextualize this against the prospect or the user that's searching? Whereas if you have a separate page for each individual program, now it offers uh, one level greater delineation for the dumb AI to say, oh, I understand this program for this age group. So you want a different page for every program, a different page for every location. Um, if you wanted to get real sneaky, you'd actually have a different page for every guide and or staff member, because I actually anticipate that being really important at some point. You know, a bio page, we, we do something at my agency, uh, it's called the Employee Spotlight. And we do a deep dive on every single individual employee. I can show you some examples. Um, and what's, what's interesting about it is it's one of our most trafficked facet of our website because we deal with an educated consumer that wants to know who they're going to work with. You were dealing with an even more educated consumer that's even more concerned about who they're going to work with. Who is my child going to spend all day, every day with? And so having that content available to you, I think is going to help us win the big shift that we're going to see in the, in the AI search space. So I'm going to pause there and see if I've A, put anybody to sleep and B, catalyzed any questions. This is Wally here. How are you? Hey, Wally. Long time no talk. Well, yes. And you have disappeared from the scene for a while. I have. I, I was tired of, of boring people to death. I thought no, Camilla would do a much no, better not, job. Not really. But uh, just a few things I want to clarify. I mean, I'm quite confused in terms of how this uh, Google ad is going to work uh, in conjunction with the AI um, scheme that Google is now implementing. For example, I think I heard you say that uh, now content of the website is becomes even more critical. Did I hear you right? That's absolutely right. Okay. Yes, sir. So that's, that's, that's fine. I understand that. Now, today, when we go through ad program, you know, through, let's say, Nino Marketing or anybody else, Google has its own ranking algorithm, right? That Correct. They use. So, and that, that's what you guys try to help uh, optimize so that, you know, one can get most visibility. Now, when is Google going to implement the AI engine now as part of the ranking uh, mechanism? Is the, the whole thing is going to be very different? In that case, uh, when we basically go through and identify keywords and all that today to help you guys, what the whole thing will be quite different the way we'll be kind of doing this uh, uh, paid ad for going forward? I'm going to drop a link into chat here, Wally, that I think is, uh, it won't answer your question, but it's it's the beginning of a start. Um, and I'm dropping this link because um, I want to protect what it is that I'm about to say. Everything that I'm going to offer you here is speculative. At the moment, Google's being very guarded about how these changes are ultimately going to manifest. Um, and so be careful about taking my advice because I'm just a guy guessing. Now that said, 
I have, I have $100 million in ad spend under management. I have 200 clients. And I hope nobody minds me sounding mildly arrogant, but I know more about SEO than most people in the world know about SEO. So I can tell you from a position of authority, here's what I think is going to happen based off of what I've seen happen. Um, I've been doing this for 17 years. And my very strong opinion is Google search quality guidelines, which it, that's the algorithm that they use in order to rank content organically, uh, isn't going to change. It can't. If you think about Google's unique value proposition, it's delivering the most relevant result first, the second most relevant result second, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they've gotten really good at that. What I think ends up happening from an AI perspective, and the reason I dropped this link, is the way the content delivers changes. And if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen and give you a very specific example. Um, let me mute this page. There we go. So when you're looking at AI delivered results and Google's calling it generative AI, uh, oh, that's the screenshot that I wanted. So you ask a question and then Google, if you can see this screen, okay, instead of the normal search results, you'll see this generative AI explanation. And so for a Montessori school, it, it, when we're top of the funnel, what's the best type of school for my child? Google's going to now say, you know, based off of different standards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you'll notice that it's offering options, which I actually think, again, works massively in our favor. Because before it was a grab bag listed one at a time, and it was hyper dependent upon the user to dive deep into the grab bag. Now the AI is forced to provide the school or provide the searcher, excuse me, with um, all of the available variables. And as long as we're doing a good job providing the content necessary to define those variables, I think that will be picked up by the AI. I, I believe that very strongly. And so I've searched about, you know, different um, uh, uh, preschool options, let's say, and then it gives me those options. Now here's where it gets really interesting. And I think a lot of fun, instead of just dumb search, uh, the generative AI mechanism that Google's developed has memory and that memory allows for context. So I can ask follow-up questions, which is really interesting. And those follow-up questions will be referential. So you can go two, three, four, five, six searches deep and your sixth discussion point with this AI driven mechanism will remember the first, second, third, and fourth thing you said. So if in the beginning you said, what's the best uh, you know, uh, educational option for my three-year-old, every subsequent question is going to keep in mind that you have a three-year-old. And that becomes hyper, hyper relevant because search isn't that way. Search is, what's the best uh, educational option for my three-year-old? And then the next search, refresh is you know why why are multi-age classrooms important well why multi-age classrooms are important in search zooms back out again what this would do in theory is it tells you why multi-age classrooms are important specifically for your three-year-old and so generative ai favors anything that has depth and breadth and montessori is a lot of things but it's especially depth and breadth and we have way more depth and breadth than most other systems of education have to offer. So I think this is massively, massively in our favor long-term if we're hosting the content. I don't think that Google search standards change at all. Uh, I think that the way that they identify relevance is going to stay the same. The way they deliver that information is going to change, which is why we're going to want to make sure that we have as robust information as possible and it's delineated as much as possible. That was question number one of you, yours. Your second question is, how are ads going to work? And the truth is, is I don't know, and neither does Google. They've gone on to say to advertisers, there's a blog post that they, they put up recently that's hysterical because it just reads like, you know, public relations, gobbledygook, smoke mirrors, but they, they're smokescreen, excuse me. They basically said, hey, ads are going to be really important in, in the generative AI ecosystem, uh, and we'll let you know how soon. Um, in, in the short term, a, a paid placement is not being included in generative AI results. In the long term, I don't see how it could not be. Google, 96% of Google's revenue comes from search ads, or not from search ads, excuse me, from ads this is going to be the most important part of their inventory. There's no way that they don't start embedding ads. Um, and I think that, and this is a really important discussion that if you, I hope everybody will stop me if we get too philosophical. I think that Google's, the future of Google targeting is going to be audience-based, not, not keyword or placement-based. So right now, when we bid inside of Google, 
we say anybody searching for Montessori school or preschool, I want to bid on them. Or anybody who's on this page for new parents or anybody who's watched this video for new parents, I want to bid on them. Those are placements and keywords. Instead, we're going to say, I want um, parents in the top 20% of income range who have children between this age and this age and are temperamentally or ideologically uh, aligned with this group for example, and I'm not saying that's what anybody wants. And then Google will say, okay, regardless of, they could be searching for car insurance. It, regardless of what they're searching for, where they're searching, we're going to try to find a way to expose them to your content in an organic fashion. And that, that exposure could potentially come through the generative AI results. Again, all of this is wildly speculative, but to be frank, I don't know how else they could possibly approach it. Um, I'm going to pause there, Wally. How was that for an answer? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm still fairly hazy in terms of uh, <laughs> Me too. Looking into, in the future, I guess I, well, that's not surprising, but I would have thought that from the business perspective, Asim, that AI, uh, they would embed AI in the Google, um, in the Google paid thing earlier, sooner than later, right? No. So here's, this is really interesting. And again, this is, um, this is conspiracy theory-esque but there's historic precedents for this too. Google has 72 million demographic and psychographic profiling factors in every human that engages with the Google ecosystem, 72 million. Facebook has 55,000, hmm. which is a fraction. However, Google has had zero congressional hearings. Facebook's had four. Right. What Google has done phenomenally well is it lets other entities take all the arrows. So Facebook rolled out interest-based segmentation first and said, hey, y'all, look, you can target people based off of you know, political or religious ideology. You can target people based off of gender or age. And everybody went like, oh my goodness, that's terrifying. Privacy, what are we gonna do? And then Facebook got annihilated. And then Google got to see how the battle took place, where the bombs fell. And then once the dust settled, they came out and said, hey, we've got some pretty cool targeting too. And all of us, and this is what's I think hysterical about just Western culture in general. We were like, yeah, we're, we're tired of being scared of that. We're just gonna move on. And so Google had something that was far, far more intrusive, far more dangerous, flew completely under the radar. Uh, Google's AI by all reports is uh, a, a factor more powerful than anything that OpenAI has produced. So Lambda, when compared to chat GPT by the experts, Lambda, which is Google's model, and I have not played with extensively, incidentally, but it's supposed to be um, much better and much more powerful. But what you'll notice is Google wasn't the first to market with AI. Google's also not been the first to market with any AI features. And yet Google has more R&D dedicated to AI than any other entity in existence. What I think they're doing, which is brilliant, Google being run by lawyers is, and, and look at what just happened 48 hours ago. Sam Altman goes in front of Congress and says, please regulate AI. So if I'm Google, I'm a trillion dollar business. I know the future of my business relies on AI. Before I start rolling out features and putting my neck out there, I want to see where the ax is going to fall. So Google, and it's, if their stock has taken a hit, it actually took a jump recently because of the IO um, updates. But I think Google's waiting everything out. And I think that they don't mind losing ground in the short term. There's the, the fun saying, which is pioneers get murdered and settlers prosper. So Google's going to let all the pioneers take all the arrows. And then once we've been able to determine, looking at the global ecosystem, where things settle, that's when they start rolling their features out. Um, and, and I think that's going to be a recurring and repetitive game plan from Google for years to come. I, I'm also, and again, this is maybe more philosophy than anybody wants. I'm more optimistic about humanity than I've ever been. If you want, if you want to spend some time listening to Sam Altman talk about AI and what AI is capable of and the problems that it could solve, it's every, every major human problem in existence from supply chain management to uh, global warming to uh, hunger. The, 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 the computing capabilities that we've been handed are unbelievably powerful. I'm a card carrying prepper. And I've just never been more optimistic about what I see as being possible now. Um, and, and I think, again, speaking to a, a collection of Montessorians, I know that technology is not necessarily our favorite thing, uh, but this is an instance where technology, what's nice about this tech is it's not 
it's not human to technology interaction. It's technology to technology interaction so the human doesn't have to do anything. And then we can go do the things that we want to do. So in, in interesting ways, I, I think this actually aligns from a paradigm perspective really strongly. Um, the big question, and again, this speaks to Montessori too, the, the jobs that we have now aren't going to exist. They're not going to exist. Like, what are we training our children to do? And what I love about Montessori and the reason my kids go to Montessori school is because Montessori trains them to think, to be around people, to, to understand relationships. But all of this like assembly line stuff, it's gone. It's gone. G uh, radiologists, you know, radiology is a $440,000 a year job to start. AI beats uh, the best radiologists in the world a thousand times out of a thousand. Radiology is gone. And that's one example of a hundred million. So there's all of these, you know, when we're trying to prepare people for the future, there's this, this future that's massively opaque and it's massively opaque because of AI. And I think that lends itself to the Montessori discussion, which is teaching people to think instead of teaching people how to do a job. I'm so sorry if that got soapboxy. I'll try not to do that again. How did I do, Wally? Well, uh, Sam Ortman also had a bunch of concerns. I know you're very optimistic, but he shared a whole bunch of concerns going forward. Yeah, I don't think he's as concerned as he pretends to be. I think the, the smart thing to do, if I'm if I'm building a nuke, the smart thing to do is for me to be like, I am just as afraid as you guys are, and we're going to be really careful. And and in, in his defense, he hires people that are hyper, hyper, hyper sensitive to what AI is possible. But if he was as concerned as he pretends to be, he wouldn't be doing what he's doing. I think he's the exact right person for the job. I think he's conscientious, thoughtful. I think he's empathic. Open AI is, or excuse me, um, his organization is built on what is effectively a nonprofit model. They're not a 501c3. They were and they transitioned, but they have a profitability cap. He is, and I'm, you can hear a little hero worship in my voice. I think he's the exact right person for this role. I, I, I've been nothing but impressed with him and the way that he's approached this. I also think his request to Congress to regulate AI is, is also a smokescreen, by the way. <laughs> There's no way Congress could know how to regulate AI. How do you regulate the thing that you don't know how it functions? And so I think what he's saying more or less is it's it's a call to action for those in the entrepreneurial community to be conscientious about what it is that they produce um, so that they don't end up getting shackled. Because what's going to happen is the, 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 the countries that stop the proliferation of technology like this are going to be so far left behind. You're not going to, it's an arms race. If you, if you're in an arms race, and you stop developing arms, and your whoever you're competing against does not, you're now at their mercy. There's no way in the world that we live in, if we're being pragmatists, especially given the, the state of affairs right now with Russia and China, there's no way we can afford to stop developing this, pragmatically speaking. Uh, and in, in you know, regardless of, of what we would want is, is empathic, loving humans, Russia's not gonna stop, China's not gonna stop, North Korea's not gonna stop, Iran's not gonna stop we can't stop. And, and I hope that didn't get too aggressive. I think that, uh, you know, there's, there's the entrepreneurial answer to this, but there's also the statecraft that's at play too. And the statecraft says whoever, whatever country develops the most robust AI is going to rule the state of information for the foreseeable future. Um, and right now we're winning 100x, which, you know, you hope stays that way. Yeah. My final question, I'll shut up for the rest of the session, let the other people kind of interject. But final question is those of us who are working with Needle uh, in terms of um, you know, website content, in terms of uh, ads and all that, in the next six months to a year, do you see us doing anything different? To be, if, if, you're not paying, if you're not taking advantage of the content, I'd love, and I know a lot of our members are not, a lot of our members don't post the content for whatever reason. Um, I think that that's one really important step to take. Um, the second one is Google local campaigns are failing miserably right now. Uh, and they're failing miserably because Google had a campaign type specifically dedicated to local businesses. They, they, they uh, deprecated that campaign type in favor of what's called Performance Max, which is their national campaign type. And Performance Max, by the way, is amazing. It's a miracle in advertising. But the issue with Performance Max is it's meant to work at scale. Local campaigns don't work at scale. So they took this great big scalable engine and they, they applied it to these small local geographies and it's, um, it's a dumpster fire at the moment. 
So my hope is that Google improves the efficacy of local campaign types and you start seeing better performance out of Google ads because right now, I mean, we've gone towards exact match search and we've done the things that we needed to do in order to account for it, but they basically took the most powerful tool off of our tool belt and they took it away. Uh, what I think every school should be doing, regardless of whether or not they're working with Nito, is maxing out their remarketing. Montessori parents are hyper A-type, hyper vigilant, and they have a long sales cycle. If somebody's gone to your website, you should follow them around for the rest of their lives with ads. And those ads, by the way, aren't ads. They're case studies, testimonials, parent stories, things that show people this is what happens to a child when they go through Montessori school. And we have all that content available and accessible. But when you follow somebody around with that narrative, you know, it can take as many as 500 touch points before somebody's ready to, to convert. And the question then becomes, how do you stay in front of somebody 500 times? Well, it's with the positive message of efficacy. And the thing that I love about remarketing so much is, number one, it's free. Until they click, you don't pay. And so you're getting tons of impressions. People are seeing your logo. They're seeing your face. They're hearing your voice. They're seeing your school. They're seeing your, your school front. Um, and, you know, depending on your, your imagery and your, your, your media. Um, and, and, and that's repetitious. And that repetition is one of the most important parts of advertising. It's why if you ever watch McDonald's or Coca-Cola commercials, it's why they all seem so stupid. Like Coca-Cola commercials, you, you, you're done with it and you're like, that felt like a waste of 15 seconds because all it is is imagery and sounds and, you know, like these just perspiring bottles. And in your mind, you're like, I don't know why Coca's wasting trillions of dollars. Well, somebody, I mean, money's not stupid. What they know is that neuroassociative conditioning increases the amount of time that people pick up a Coca-Cola. And we can do that same thing. It's the coolest part about digital marketing is the thing that was only available and accessible to these massive brands just became available and accessible to us. And so we can repeatedly um, permeate people's uh, uh, view with our message. That's number one. Um, it's It doesn't cost us anything. And the traffic that's coming to your site is the most valuable traffic you'll ever have. So instead of paying to go get new traffic, which is super expensive, you can have a really robust free marketing campaign for a couple hundred bucks. And for a couple hundred dollars, you're getting back in front of all these parents that are hyper, hyper qualified, especially if you're vigilant about who you're remarketing to. Did they go to a programs page? Did they download um, your tuition rates? You know, have they gone back a couple of times? I like to filter out anybody who bounced within 10 seconds because I know that they're not necessarily applicable to me or, um, you know, it could be spammers, solicitors, et cetera. So there's ways to maximize the value of your remarketing spend. Um, and I, I, would, I would advise everybody to do that. And then to be frank, Wally, a lot of this is we need to wait and see. I mean, the, the, the announcement Google made was, I think, May 10th, it was eight days ago, and it's all still in beta. And so we're going to wait and see where the beta lands, and then we're going to adjust accordingly. The benefit we have is I think we've got 50 schools right now with ad spend under management. So we get to see the change before anybody else gets to see the change because we get to monitor it across 50 levels of analysis. And we'll share that. We've never been shy about sharing our learning lessons with everybody. Who in your organization can help us with the remarketing part of it? Is it someone we, we go to commit for that? We go to XYZ? Who, do, who in your organization should be working with? My expectation, Wally, is you probably already have remarketing running. And if you don't, then yeah, reach out to Camille or who's your client okay. manager? Is it MySoul? MySoul. Yeah, just let them know, hey, we wanted to play remarketing. And okay. the way for you to be proactive here, Wally, this is something that we'll never be able to tell you is you tell us who your most important prospects are. You know, for instance, if you're like, I really need people in the primary program, well, let's boost your remarketing to people that go to the primary program page. Um, because otherwise, you know, there's no way that anybody at Nito is going to know that. So if you can tell us this is what we want more of, we can, you know, over index for that type of prospect. Okay. And if you're not working with Nito, by the way, setting up remarketing is relatively easy. You can get somebody on Upwork to do it for you for, you know, I don't know what, two, three hundred dollars. So don't sleep on remarketing um, or Fiverr. Uh, they're, they're, I, I'm honest, you can do it yourself with some YouTube search in, but it might not be worth, worth your time. Thanks for all the great questions, Wally. Sure. Other questions? How am I doing? Is this relevant or ish? Relevant ish? Okay. <laughs> uh oh i'm sorry thanks elizabeth um are you part of the needle group i am uh uh margaret i was uh i'm one of the co-founders um i'm just silent to be frank and a lot of that stems from the fact that i'm not a montessorian and so i, I like to um 
be cautious about when I speak because there's you know very little I know about Montessori outside of being a Montessori parent, but there's a lot I know about digital marketing. And so I like to come in every now and again and um, you know help update and uh, offer my insights on the marketing piece. I own a marketing agency called Solutions 8. At the risk of sounding arrogant, it's one of the top ranked Google ads agencies on the planet. Um, the book that I just wrote called You Versus Google was number one in the world for both advertising and marketing. So, uh, and I don't say any of that to be a jerk. I just say that. So I, I want you all to feel comfortable with the information that you're getting. It's not, you know, I'm not making it up. I'm gathering it from epic amounts of failure. Thank you, Elizabeth. I appreciate you. Any other questions, comments, concerns, confessions, soliloquies, monologues, pontifications, prognostications? We rely on you for pontifications. Yeah. Um, the, it's funny, Wally, because the, the next thing on my list that I want to tackle was the remarketing piece, but you beat me to that punch. I think every school should be running remarketing. I also think that we should pay very close attention to um, the convertibility of the website. Can parents do everything they need to do from the website, or are we forcing them to contact us? Um, two years ago, this was pretty important. Today, it's critical, especially because so many other schools are offering really deep dives all the way up to virtual tours. And so the more you can allow somebody to do digitally, the more you're going to be going to continue to be included in whatever the competitive process might look like. Uh, Margaret says, I have someone coming in the, co uh, in the coming school year and would like to hear this. Is it recorded? It is. Yes, ma'am. These are all available inside of Montessori Thrive. That's right. Right, Camilla? They're in Thrive. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, and I'll, I'll offer additional updates as they trickle in. Um, I think the AI piece is going to be especially interesting. I also think it's interesting that the both founders of Google went to Montessori school. Um, and Matt has a recording of them somewhere talking about how impactful it was. Uh, so if we want to bring this full circle and get a little meta with it, Google exists because of, of Montessori education. I don't want to cut this short at all. I have another half hour dedicated, but I shot all my bullets. Any other questions, comments? I know that Google um, ads and pay traffic isn't necessarily the top of your expertise as a school leader, but um, if anything comes to mind, um, I have a quick question. Um, that might, maybe some other people might benefit from this, um, in terms of content, I know you said it's really important to really be looking at content. Um, is there anything other than a blog that we can really focus on improving content, um, that will kind of help with AI and all these updates that Google is doing? It's a phenomenal question. It's videos, uh, video-based content. And we have a ton of videos in the needle repository that were shot by Donna DeHustelaire. Donna's one of my favorite people in the whole wide world. Um, I think we have close to a hundred videos of her uh, and they're, they're white label. And what I mean by that is there's no branding on it whatsoever. So you can use these videos and it's Donna explaining different um, Montessori concepts. The problem with them is it's not you. So they're better than nothing, but in a perfect world, it's somebody who's visible in the school producing video-based content. And, I, you know, that's just such a tall, it's a big, it's a tall order. It's a big ask. Um, what I do to create content is I batch produce my content. I spend two hours once a week. So every Monday from nine to 11, I shoot a ton of videos and then my editing team cuts them up. Um, I know that Montessori schools might not necessarily have that resource internally, I will tell you that it's so much easier than it sounds or feels. If you have an iPhone that's as much as three years old, you have a better camera on your phone than James Cameron had to shoot the first avatar. Uh, you don't need great big fancy equipment. If you just took your iPhone out, you put it vertical, and then you had an idea and you shot that idea and you did that a couple of times. You know, one thing we should start doing, Camilla, is, is part of our, because we offer unlimited graphic design. I don't think we offer video editing, do we? 
We do in our graphic design. Yes, we do. do. Really? And Dave amazing. has edited some amazing videos and he does it with just pictures. So you don't have to hire a videographer. If you have pictures of photography of your school and you send them to our graphic designer, if you're part of our graphic design um, content subscriber, he will put together a uh, great videos that you can add to your website. You can post on your YouTube and he's really done a great job with the ones he's done in the past. I love that. So I didn't realize that we were offering editing. Everybody should be taking advantage of that. Send, you know, a Dropbox or a Google Drive with the, the video files that you have and then get those cut up. And what's nice about those videos being cut up is, is you can put them literally everywhere. So you could have, you know, YouTube videos, YouTube shorts, Instagram reels, Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, Snapchat. Um, and, and don't worry about being on all those channels if you're not on those channels. Go to the channels that your parents are on or the channels that you're comfortable with or the channels that whoever's helping manage this is, is currently on. Um, you just need to be on one or two. My favorite for Montessori schools right now is Instagram. Uh, and to be honest, it's because every mom is on Instagram. So if you're producing content, YouTube is nice because it's evergreen. Instagram is nice because moms are on it. Um, Facebook is starting to age a little. And I say that as a, as a Facebook user, but Facebook is, you know, um, aging out of the Montessori epoch. Uh, that's not to say don't use Facebook. It's also based heavily on geography. What we've found is in middle America, um, Facebook is still veers a little bit younger, but as you get to the coasts on either side, Instagram tends to spike in usage. Um, but I think video content is among the most important type of content you can produce. Um, and if you can turn it into a habit and get really good at habituating that, again, other schools aren't going to do it. And so it, it puts you ahead of the curve massively. Google also prioritizes video content. Facebook prioritizes video content. And when I say Facebook, I mean Facebook and Instagram. They're both owned by Meta. Um, and on that note, I think everybody should be running Facebook and Instagram remarketing ads. If somebody comes to your site, that's such strong intrinsic qualification of interest. So they should see you across Facebook and Instagram. But in a perfect world, and this, by the way, is egg on our face because there's no way for us to do this internally at Nito without the media. If all they're seeing is your school and your logo and you know, sign up to come take a tour, that's good, but it's not great. What would be great are parent stories, case studies, you know, the type of videos that we're talking about, um, testimonials, um, you talking about what sets your school apart, makes your school different, why Montessori is important. And the narrative that you choose is dependent upon your competitive ecosystem. If, I've, if I'm one Montessori school of three, then I want to talk about why my Montessori approach is better than the other Montessori schools. If I'm the only Montessori school in my area, then I want to talk about why Montessori is more important specifically as opposed to other systems of education. So take where you are and who you're competing against and then craft your narrative accordingly. Who is it that the parents are looking at other than you? And that's who we should be speaking to. And we want to make sure we arm the parents with all the right information. The issue that Montessori will always face is a confused mind says no, and Montessori is confusing. The first time I toured a Montessori school, I was overwhelmed and I put my son in a Spanish immersion school because the Montessori thing was, there was so much to learn and to know. Uh, the gal that gave me the tour, she was overwhelmed that day, I could tell, and kind of sped through things. And I didn't really get it and it felt kind of messy. And I was like, all right, I don't know what's going on here, but, but Spanish is easy. All right, my kid's going to be bilingual. That's great. And when you're competing against you know, Spanish immersion or kinder care, all kinder care has to sell is, is safety and Clorox. It's like, hey, the doors are locked and everything's clean. And as a parent, you're like, that's, you know, that's great. And if they harp on that, I understand that value proposition. And so Montessori has an exponentially more valuable proposition, but it's harder to understand. And so the, the onus of responsibility is on us to explain that. And the way to do that is into bite-sized pieces. Um, seeing a message from Chelsea. Would you recommend having a simple, clean homepage with somewhat limited content and more thorough information on each individual page? Yes, ma'am. What's interesting about your homepage is it's proving to be less and less important as time wears on because um, both through organic search and paid search, people generally skip the homepage and then go straight to whatever page is most relevant to their interest. So having, and I mentioned this at the beginning of the call, you might not have been here yet, Chelsea. Uh, my recommendation to everybody is to have a, a, a content-rich website that has a robust site map. And here's what that means, by the way, so it doesn't sound like I'm using just buzzwords. I hate buzzwords. Um, so here's our website template. And the site map is 
the table of contents for the website. So if you were to look at this menu on a, in a Word document or a Google document, you would see the primary categories are Montessori programs, admission about, give, blog, and contact. The secondary categories are why Montessori, the Montessori approach, Montessori FAQs, Montessori video FAQs, all under this one category. And there could even potentially be tertiary categories. Um, let's see if we have any. We don't. So a robust sitemap gives search engines, uh, social media engines, uh, AI-driven engines, the ability to land people on the exact right page for their particular interest. So the example I gave everybody earlier was don't have a programs page with all of your programs on it. Instead, have one page for each individual program and then define that program with as much detail as you possibly can. And I actually really like our website templates, which by the way, steal shamelessly from our, our templates. Even if you're not a Needle member, you can come here and you can, please don't steal the media, but, and steal is the wrong word, be inspired by the best practices that we put forth because we have, I don't know, I bet you we have more than a hundred deployed now or we have since the, the beginning of NITO. And we've been able to see what works. Um, really big, massive emphasis on images, uh, ongoing and consistent call to action. You'll notice that you're never on the page without seeing, you know, here's schedule a tour, schedule a tour. And you, you want to tell people what to do and be really specific about it. That's my son, by the way. That's Sammy. Uh, my kids are in all the stock photos. I'll find Ronan here in a little bit. Um, recurring repetitive use of social proof. This is so, 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 so important. The more social proof you can get, the better. If you can get video-based social proof, that's even better. Some of your parents are going to be comfortable doing it. Some of them won't. You'll probably know who's who. Um, the way I like to ask for this, by the way, or the way that we've seen most effective, it's a little flattering, but you say, you know, hey, I really want more parents just like you. You're, you're the exact type of family we're looking for, looking for. You're so mission appropriate. Would you mind shooting me a video talking about your experience with my school? And then what you can do is people tend to ramble, which is great. Let them ramble. You can cut that video up into three, four, five, six different segments. And, you know, they can be short as five or 10 seconds long, as long as you get one thought. Um, the, the, the testimonial I gave to my school, my son was going to a Spanish immersion school in the beginning. Didn't like it. He felt deflated. I pulled him out of that, went back to Montessori, and he lit up. That's a video right there. Just that one, you know, kind of pull what juxtaposition. Um, and if you can get a couple of those out of parents, that's the type of thing that you could host on a page like this. You'll also notice some of this feels almost condescending in its simplicity. That's okay. This is all based off of, um, there's a guy named Donald Miller uh, who owns a company called Story Brand. He wrote a book called Story Brand. And what he did was develop what I think ends up being the most effective method of delivering a message on a website, period, full stop. And our website templates are all based off of the story brand model. And you'll notice, you can actually see it here on his site. He's a little, you know, I mean, we're using stick figure art and really simple steps. And he always has a primary call to action and a transitional call to action. And he always uses really strong social proof as well. And it, you know, always uses the rule of three and always uses big, bright, beautiful images. We've done the exact same thing inside of our website template. Um, and you know, they're content rich. You'll also notice that we have a transitional call to action, but I like to wait till the bottom of the page. If you haven't scheduled a tour, well, you know, at the very end, it's like, hey, before you leave, why don't I send you my white paper? I prefer using tuition as the transitional call to action. A lot of schools don't like doing this, that's okay. But if somebody's really interested in um, tuition information, then we know that they're, it's like them raising their hand saying, hey, come talk to me. Um, and so I, you know, I'd, I'd recommend or encourage the use of that. If you're using our tools, that's easy to set up. If you're not, it's easy to set up. Um, you know, Somebody fills out the form for tuition information and then we email it directly to them. But uh, this is a great example of a website. I think uh, Camille's done a great job. And we've got, I don't know what, five or six different templates available too. Um, all with, you know, kind of a different look and feel. But my strong opinion is don't pay too much attention to the website template because it's the imagery and the content that make the website. The template's just the frame. So, you know, if you're, if you're a fine artist, you want to spend as much time on the, the content as you would on the painting and as much time on the template as you would picking out the frame, which isn't no time right? It's some amount of time and the frame is impactful, but it's not, it's not the most important thing by any means.
I hope that was helpful. Websites are what we call the leaky bucket. I have clients that come to me all the time and they're like, we need more traffic. And I look at their website and I'm like, you don't need more traffic. You're pouring water into a leaky bucket. What you need to do is you need to shore up your bucket. And very often with schools, when we rebuild their website, before we even start driving traffic, their admissions go up. Well, let me say that differently. Their tours and inquiries go up first. That's the lead indicator. And then that'll result in admissions just because they've improved their ability to capture parent information, attract parents, speak to parents, et cetera. Um, yeah, so that's my website soapbox. Uh, question from Margaret, do you suggest not to put the tuition on the website? You know, this is a balance of risks. It depends on where you are in terms of your sales pipeline. And I know that's a word that nobody likes. So maybe we'll call it the admissions pipeline. Um, if I'm overwhelmed with inquiries and I have a waiting list, I'll publish the tuition. I'll say, hey, this is what this costs. And so this is especially true if you're in um, areas that are... Uh, socioeconomically diverse and not everybody can afford tuition. Um, you know, and, and if you have a scholarship program, that's a good place to put that too. Hey, by the way, here's what tuition costs. Here's our scholarship program. But what's nice is you allow people to self-qualify. So if you're getting a bunch of people scheduling a tour and then when they come in, they're like, oh my goodness, I had no idea it was this expensive. That's a, that's a great opportunity for you to publish your tuition. And to be frank, save yourself some time. What Matt did at Bergamo, what I thought was brilliant is he has four locations. He didn't publish his tuition because he wanted the opportunity to speak to the parent. And what you don't want to do is you don't want somebody to go to see the tuition and be like, oh my goodness, it's so expensive and leave before understanding why it's maybe more expensive. Like, oh, this is so much better for my child's brain. Might be worth a couple hundred extra dollars more. So what Matt did, which is I think the best of both worlds, is um, allowed people to book a tour while they were waiting for their tour because his tours were booked out a couple of weeks in advance usually or a week in advance he would drip on them he would nurture them with a, an automated email sequence why montessori is important for your child the difference between montessori specific to the age group that they chose but embedded in that was also tuition information so it was you know build up the value and then show you what it costs and every now and again he'd have somebody who got the tuition email which i think was like email, email number three or four and then would cancel the tour and at that point he said you know what that's okay if they got all the information I could give them on why this is so valuable, and then they saw what it cost, I don't mind them canceling because it probably means that they weren't the right fit. He's in a pretty luxurious position, though, in that he's not really had a problem with admissions, um, you know, COVID aside. So if, if uh, admissions is a problem, if you're more flexible with your rates, those types of things, then you, you might want to put your tuition information behind a gate. And I really like having tuition information behind a gate. To be really honest, and I, I've tried to champion this cause, and I, I've never won ever once. Um, I believe strongly what Montessori schools should be doing. What I would have appreciated as a parent is if somebody requests tuition information, they get a phone call from an administrator or a guide or you know whoever's applicable ahead of school that just says, hey, shopping for school is so hard. And there's so many options out there. I just want to help. Tell me a little bit about your concerns and your child. And you move yourself from salesperson to trusted guide. Um, and maybe you even talk them out of it. You know, you say, listen, Montessori is not for everybody. If, if you really want homework, if you think your kid's going to be a doctor and has to go to Harvard, like maybe we're not the right fit for you. But that type of negative selling, that consultative selling, I think can be really helpful and really powerful. But if somebody's downloading tuition information, I think they get a phone call. Um, and I think they appreciate that call, especially if it's not, do you want to come in and see my school and give me money? Instead, it's, hey, I care about you. I care about children. I care about our community. And I want to make sure that you land in the right place, even if it's not with us. I'd love to spend 20 minutes with you talking about your, you know, whatever it is you're concerned with. And you might find a ton of people that aren't mission appropriate, but then you start referring them to, I don't know who. I also think that, and I've seen a couple of schools do this. Chesterfield Montessori out of St. Louis, Missouri did the, the best. They had really strong referral relationships with other schools. I remember Lise telling me about them. And if somebody came in that for whatever reason, you know, maybe they had a, a child with special needs that she couldn't fulfill, she knew exactly where to send them. And then that school, through the rule that is reciprocity, started sending her people too. And so I think that once you do that, you become the hub to the spokes of your community. And that's where a Montessori school should be. Um, I think that that's a, a pretty 
powerful place to be, especially given that, you know, I mean, might be headed into a recession and things are going to change and people are going to be looking at what it is that they're spending. Um, I like having multiple avenues for, for family acquisition. One concern I have about nurturing emails from the, from the time the, the friend engages is that, and there's a fine balance. I mean, if many nurturing emails are coming your way, sometimes it's a, it's a off uh, as, as the school being too assertive, too aggressive. Uh, I mean, how does one determine what a, a good balance is? Because I've, I've heard of situations where people just get turned off when you're getting every week, you're getting a, an email from, from the school. Yeah. Uh, I, and I don't think it's every week. Well, I, in some instances, I'd say it's every day. Um, <laughs> yeah, the first so the first question is, is, is your email an ask or a give? Am I asking you for something? Hey, come and take a tour. Hey, tell me more about you. Hey, give me this thing. Or is it a give? I wanted you to know, here's something that could really impact your child. Here's something that's really important for you to have. Here's a resource that I've created that I wanted to gift you with. As long as it's a give, I think you're in a defensible position. And I'll give you the analogy that was just given to me a few days ago. I was on a mastermind call with a, a group of entrepreneurs that I engage with regularly. And a gentleman that does, um, he's very successful with online challenges. Uh, he said this about the responsibility to sell. He said that if you are talking to someone who's about to go out on a boat, so they're boarding a boat and they're, and they're, and they're going to go out into the ocean and you know that's a leaky boat, and you're selling life jackets, it's your responsibility to do everything you possibly can to get them into a life jacket. Because you know they're getting on a boat, you know it's a leaky boat, and you know they're going out into the ocean. And I can tell you, parenthood is a leaky boat. Raising children is a leaky boat, and you are out on the ocean. And Montessori is one hell of a freaking life jacket. And so the interesting thing about the nurture campaigns is anytime anybody responds negatively, we all go, oh, never again, not going to do that. But sometimes that negative response is good. Sometimes you hit a chord or you hit a nerve or you, you're talking to the right person. Uh, I, I love the Henry Ford quote. He said, if I gave people what they want, I would have created a faster horse. So just because you have one person out of, and that's what it always is, right? Like the squawky person is always, the loud one is always the one out of 50. Uh, so one out of a hundred, like it's very rare that people complain about receiving value, but we're, we're primed to hear negative um, and then instantly pull back on what works. Well, what about the 99 people that you were helping with the life jacket, even if they weren't necessarily going to your school? Now they know how to, how to audit a, a school more effectively. Now, you know, they, they, they know what questions to ask and um, what might be right for their child. So I think if we all view what it is that we have as the life jacket, um, I think it at a minimum emboldens us to be a little bit more aggressive. And and this is the thing that I like about the needle content is it's all a give. You go into Montessori Thrive, you look at some of those white papers, you read, Matt wrote most of those himself. They're amazing. They're amazing. It's so valuable. There's so much value to offer parents. And so go out like you're giving people life jackets. And to be frank, there's an unsubscribe button at the bottom of every freaking email. Every SMS that's ever been sent out says text stop to stop. Anybody who responds negatively is just having a bad day. You know, like it's such an easy problem to solve that anybody's like, oh, why are you sending me emails? Because you gave me your email, smart guy. You don't want them. Unsubscribe. I told you, we all knew what this was. You know, it's 2023. In 2008, when you started carpet bombing with emails, I understand them getting a little frustrated. But at this point, I've just lost all sympathy for anybody who's like, oh, I can't believe this is happening. You know, like, what a surprise. So, uh, and maybe that's me just being petulant. Um, yeah, I hope that didn't sound like I was diminishing your concerns, Wally. No, that's, that's fine. I mean, I have always worried about it, uh, not knowing exactly uh, but we haven't really done done uh, a very good job at it to know to get some good data about it. Uh, that's one. Um, but I was wondering if you feel that I mean, marketing and remarketing obviously a very important item for any school. Do you feel that it requires like almost like a full time dedicated resource to be able no. to do this right? Good. I I don't think a school on the planet could afford it. That's why we started Needle in the first place. You know what what Matt was paying me was a very healthy five figure sum. 
when I was, my, I was just Matt's, for anybody that doesn't know the story, Matt owned Montessori schools. I was just a marketer. I'm doing all this marketing for Matt. Uh, I'm good at what I do. And Matt kept saying, man, every school needs this. And I'd say, dude, send him my way. I'll, I'll take more clients. And he goes, no, you don't understand. Like you know, he, A, has a great big school with 500 students and can afford it. B, forward thinking, kind of got the digital marketing thing. He's like, nobody can afford what I'm spending. So what we did is we took everything that we were doing for Bergamo. We, we commoditized it via the system that is scale. And then we gave it to schools. So I hope you don't mind me saying this, Wally. You're already a customer, so I'm not trying to sell you. What you're getting is what a dedicated resource could do and not do as well. Because instead of doing one dedicated resource for one school, it's a collection of resources, a graphic designer, a video editor, a Google Ads manager, a website designer, et cetera, et cetera. But doing the same thing for multiple schools. So you've got an entire team on your, on your slate. And I think a dedicated resource in the realm of digital marketing specifically is going to end up twiddling their thumbs because of how scalable marketing is. If I had a dedicated resource for anything, it would be a community manager. And that community manager would do something like what I talked about after a parent reaches out, um, build relationships with other organizations. Every Montessori school should know the ballet school next to them, the karate school next to them, who the, the youth soccer league is like how you build and put those tendrils out, make your school the hub. Everybody all the time forever needs a location. And this just happened to me. I'm in a group called Front Row Dads. It's a bunch of dads that want to be better fathers and better husbands. And um, they're, they're all over the world, but there's, I don't know what, 12 or 13 dads inside in Phoenix, Arizona that all wanted to meet up. We couldn't figure out where to go. We were talking about like renting a space. If my local Montessori school had sent out a message and said, hey, just so you know, we want to be a community hub. We've got this really awesome green belt or this really awesome gazebo or this really awesome whatever. Um, I think a dedicated resource would be would, would do something along those lines and, and do community management. Because that's, that's what I want. I want to know every parent that goes to my child's school. I want to know their names. I want to know what they do for a living. I want to know what they do for fun. Because their kids are spending time with my kids. My son came home the other day. This is 48 hours ago. And he started saying, bruh. And like, we would say like, eat your broccoli. And he'd go, bruh. And I was like, I'm going to tase you, number one. Number two, I'm going to find out what kid you learned this from. And I'm going to find whatever way I can to separate that, that connection. And if I knew parents, I could, I could, you know, we could have that conversation together. Um, but we're not keyed into our community very well. So that's where I would, I would commit to a resource. I hope that's helpful, Wally. You can tell me yeah. if it's not. No, basically what it's telling me is that I mean, we in our school are just not using the resources of need of marketing properly. I mean, that's something that I need to get back to Camille or somebody and say, hey guys, how do we just plan a strategy? How do we do that so that we don't get basically submerged in trying to do things and let you guys help us move forward? Maybe that's what, what was needed. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, don't beat yourself up too much because the disadvantage you are at is we can only do it halfway. We build half the bridge. So it's, hey, here are the resources. Well, someone's got to post them. You know, hey, here are the videos. Somebody's got to decide how to use them. Hey, here's the nurture campaign. Somebody's got to edit them. So I don't think that's a full-time person at all. I think that's probably one hour a week, let's say. Um, but it needs to be done. So, you know, the, 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 the trade-off in working with a company like Nito is it is templatized and somebody does need to take it and make it your own. Um, and, and that trade's not good for everybody. We've had a couple of schools that really did want and need something in house. And usually they're multi-location or very specific or, you know, make a departure from Montessori. So the content's not quite as applicable. Um, yeah, but you know, we do our best to bring as much value as we possibly can. And if you haven't checked out Thrive recently, I was just in there the other day showing some people what we've built. It's insane. Camilla, you've done such a good job. Like the amount of resources inside of Thrive, it's overwhelming. You know, you can start a Montessori school just from what's inside of Thrive. And what's really cool about it too is it's amalgamated from the community. And anything y'all want, by the way, go send a request because we send an email out to all 5,000 people on our list. And, you know, we'll get 5, 10, 15, 20 responses. Oh yeah, I have that. And then we compile it, sterilize it, and then post it to the directory. Um, so it's a pretty cool, pretty cool community. I understand Matt just redesigned his website. Is that true? You know? <laughs> Matt always just redesigned his website, Wally. He never stops. He has a problem. We're going to have an intervention. We're going to surround him with love. And we're going to get him to stop tinkering. Okay. So I'm, I'm just, I was just curious if he's using some of the templates you guys have as a, as a thing or he's going on his own. He's not. He went ultra custom. And that's because he has a, a very 
specific and custom tech stack. Max, you know, it's a larger operation that he's running uh, and it's grown since we built all of our templates. And so he needed some, um, some he had some specific technical requirements that most schools aren't going to have. So we chose not to mm. bake those in. And I apologize, y'all. I'm uh, scheduled here for an hour and I've got a job because I have another call. Just out of curiosity, was this helpful on a scale from one to 10? One, you hate my face and my voice, and 10, you do this again. Was this somewhere on the positive end of that spectrum? It was overwhelming, but very helpful. I'm glad. Well, thanks for the questions, Wally. Thank you, everybody. Margo, Elizabeth, for showing up. Everybody else, I don't believe that you're real. I assume that you're an AI driven avatar. Uh, Camilla, thanks for putting this together. Thank you so much, Kassam. We'll be back next week at our normal time, so 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern. We look forward to seeing you. All right, everyone. Have a great rest of your Thursday. All right, y'all. High fives.